so let's talk Fire Warriors, Battle Suits, Troop Mercenaries, and Farsight Enclaves with an overview of Codex Tower Empire for Warhammer 40k 10th edition. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, where today we're talking Tau, and there's lots of updated rules and new ways to play for the faction with the release of their Codex for 10th edition Warhammer 40k. So far in the edition I'd say that Tau are in at least a fairly good spot, maybe not every single unit super stand out, though the vast majority of their index was pretty playable, and in a fairly good spot game balance wise as well, not utterly just ruling the roost and stomping all the other armies, but certainly not one of the weaker armies in the game either. The 10th edition codex release comes out alongside a big range of new crews, plenty of new data sheets, and quite fun to have the alien allies of the faction in the front and centre stage for a change. Games Workshop does seem to have tried to make them a mini faction within the same army, far more so than they were before. For the contents of the codex, there's plenty of the standard stuff that you'd get in most books in Warhammer 40k. Thor and miniature galleries explaining the way that they fight and some nicely painted models, crusade content for the army and the combat patrol rules. As per normal with my videos though, we're going to be talking through the core rules for the army, all the detachments, data sheets and changes. The army's core rule is the greater good, units working in pairs to coordinate firepower for greater gain. The codex has four detachments in it, all of which I think are at least fairly interesting with a fond primary special rule. 4 enhancements and 6 stratagems. There's 38 data sheets in this codex, not including combat patrol ones, plus a page of generic drone rules. Quite a lot of new data sheets, with splitting the crisis battle suits into 3 units, the same with the shapers and crew lone spears and rampages. Unfortunately, 5 data sheets have been lost, 3 fine cast characters, and 2 models that didn't really have an actual proper kit. I'll get onto them in the data sheet section. As per standard, with the 10th edition codexes, the points section is kind of redundant. Games Workshop will release points as a digital download, so I'm not going to focus too hard on those numbers today. The majority of the numbers are the ones from the start of 10th edition, where a whole bunch of Tau units were kind of ludicrously overcosted. The only ones that I think are really worth dwelling on are the enhancement costs, as they don't tend to change quite so much, as they maybe aren't so crazily important to keep fine-tuned balanced. And the ones for the new units, which are our only way of getting roughly where GW might cost them. Loads to talk about though, so let's start out with the for the greater good rule, then talk through each detachment in turn, then get on to the data sheets. Broadly speaking, I feel like it's perhaps one of the better realised codexes out of 10th edition. All four of the detachments seem genuinely interesting, though I feel like there are going to be some data sheet changes and removed units that are going to annoy people. And of course, overall army strength is always going to be dependent on the final points cost. First up, we have the army rule for the greater good. This represents the Tau's combined fields of fire doctrine in 10th edition, which was previously realised with variations of Overwatch in past editions. Markalites also previously had special rules, but now are entirely part of this mechanic. There's a lot of fireprint wording to it, though it basically boils down to units working in pairs for greater damage, having an observer unit and a guided unit to nominate a spotted unit, and then the guided unit gets plus one ballistic skill against that target. That is kind of helpful as it's better than a plus one to hit, as it can stack with that. And as a bonus as well, if the observer unit that was spotting for you did have the marker like keyword, the guided unit also gets to ignore cover against the target. It does really reward focused firepower though, you get minus one ballistic skill if you fire any shots elsewhere for the guided unit. Maybe a little bit unhelpful for say a tank where you've got a big gun and a bunch of small arms, those small arms might actually get a bit worse due to the guiding. Otherwise the observer unit can fire elsewhere, though it doesn't actually get buffs from this rule. And in general I quite like the feel of it as making tower units work together. Lots of units going from Ballistic Skill 4 plus to Ballistic Skill 3 plus is a big deal. It's kind of needed to keep your best firepower units efficient. It maybe makes some slightly more interesting decisions in the shooting phase for what's going to guide what and whether you're going to split fire with anything or not. And some units make guiding a fair bit better. Stealth suits that improved in this codex and Forge World Tetras for re-rolling the hit rolls. I feel like unless they massively overcost stealth suits, they're going to be a bit more interesting for tower players going forward. I'd bear in mind that despite it being the army rule as well, it's not actually a rule on every single model's datasheet. Things like Crute and Vespid don't get for the greater good, so you can't use them to act as cheap spotters or get them guided at all. 
Overall, though, I do quite like the way it plays, and quite a lot of the other rules in the detachments and things key off it. Beyond the core rule, though, next up we have the detachment, the things that get you a detachment rule, four enhancements and six stratagems for your force, giving you the majority of the supporting rules. As with the detachments we're used to seeing in Warhammer 40k, none of them actually fully lock out any models. The only real major restriction that you have for Tau Empire armies is that you either have to choose between Commander Farsight's data sheet or taking Ethereals in the army. Given that the Renegade Commander disavowed them, they don't really get on very well. That's listed on Commander Farsight's data sheet though, rather than the actual detachment page. In theory, it does mean that you could take any collection of Tau recruit units and fill them with any detachment, but as ever, the supporting rules tend to be geared towards certain subsets of units. Both Kaoyon and Montcar are fairly general purpose, though the other two are heavily unit specific. The four detachments are Kaoyon, which we'll know from the index. This one's a fairly generalist one, focusing on a few slightly sneakier tricks, with a big emphasis on late game damage, so keep your units hidden for a few turns, then spring forward and attack. Montcar is the aggressive tower force, damage buffs on the first few turns, and some nice movement tricks too. The Retaliation Cadre is the battlesuit focused one. Literally every rule in the detachment is only for battlesuits of various sizes, probably most focused on Crisis and Commanders dropping in close to deal with the enemy, though can support the rest as well. And finally we have the Crute Hunting Pack, pretty much entirely focused on the Crute units in the army. It doesn't mean that you can't take Tau units alongside though, they're just not going to get any stratagem or enhancement support, though you could take a few big guns along to help deal with enemy heavy hitters, which the crew units might struggle with. I was maybe a little bit surprised that Tau only got four detachments, and if you're not going heavy on crew, then you really only have three to choose from. Seems a bit strange when Necrons and even Admech both got five and Tyranids got six. I feel like you could see that as a bit of a negative, but at least at first glance, I would rate them as all interesting detachments at least, having enough raw power to make you genuinely want to build your army in different ways and most of them having some fun tricks that they can do for stratagem support. I guess we'll see which of them wind up being competitively dominant or whatever, but at first glance all of them look usable at least casually. Jumping into those detachments, and first up we have the Retaliation Cadre. This one's the battlesuit focused one, perhaps inspired around Farsight Bomb Heavy Crisis Suit style list. It does mean that you could have a lot of support for loads of different crises on the board if you wanted. The core rule is bonded heroes, so compared with pre-codex Tau, that's be replacing the Kaoyon sustained hits on turn 3 onwards, and for this one it's a battlesuit focus buff as you'd expect, plus 1 strength on their ranged weapons within 12 inches, and plus 1 AP on those ranged weapons within 6. The strength will be a bit variable as to actually how helpful it is, I guess it's going to be more useful to anything that gets to a good break point by that plus 1 strength, Missile pods being strength 8, flamers strength 5, burst cannons strength 6, or fusion blasters strength 10 all seem kind of good, and it is something that you can reliably get out of deep strike. Maybe seems kind of fun for those Sunforge crisis suits there, strength 10 fusion blasters from the sky. The AP bit is maybe a bit more reliably useful, but you do have to get very very close to access it. Even with units with good movement, they might struggle but it does mean that you can pretty well punish enemies that are moving towards you really quite quickly, stepping up to the plate and hitting them hard. It could be pretty handy as well if your battle suits are locked in close combat and having to fire with big guns never tire, that means they'd trigger both buffs. Could be nice for cold star commanders perhaps to deliver suits into those close ranges with the advance and shoot that it can bring. Overall I'd say it's interesting enough, though maybe not super powerful. Getting into stratagems, and first up we have the Shortened Blade for 2 command points. This one allows a battlesuit unit to deep strike anywhere that's 3 inches away, and he can't charge after. I feel like 2 command points, this one is genuinely quite pricey. It is quite nice to be able to guarantee that delivery into the buff range, though given crisis suits went down to just 3 models per unit, it just really doesn't feel anywhere near as efficient as it would have been before. Still though, this could be interesting on perhaps a dedicated tank destroyer unit, maybe a bunch of Sunforge battlesuits with the Crisis Commander with a bunch of fusion blasters attached, could be a pretty powerful point and delete massive punch. Does mean that you could do interesting tricks around objectives as well, you could have a bunch of anti-inventory style battlesuits deep strike right behind the enemy lines, and mow down perhaps a unit holding a home field objective. For 1cp there's the Torchstar Gambit, 
This one's classic Tao style jump shoot jump shenanigans. Any battle suit with a fly keyword gets to normal move after shooting. So you could have crisis suits jump out, shoot something and then move back to safety behind terrain. You can't charge after that and you can't do it if you start an engagement range. But again that one's a really powerful one. Being able to move out, shoot and then hide again is going to be big on really big powerful battle suit units. And this one's one that they sort of nicked from the Cao Yon detachment, which doesn't have it anymore, but it's even cheaper than that, despite it being one of the best stratagems there. I certainly think that this one will be a staple. You can have suits go incredibly quickly across the board here, even if you don't care too much about their shooting or hiding. That kind of movement boost is well worth 1 CP. Next up, for 2 CP we've got the Failsafe Detonator. This one is triggered when the battlesuit model is destroyed. You get to auto-trigger its deadly demise or automatically prevent it, weirdly enough. Or if the unit does not have deadly demise, you have a 4 plus chance for each unit within 6 inches to take D3 mortal wounds. I feel like this will be really fun and a source of strength if it was 1 CP. At 2 CP, it's maybe often not going to be worth it versus the other options, I think. My instincts are that it might be best on a riptide battlesuit if it's usable at all. That's got a big deadly demise, D6. If you had it in the heart of the enemy army when it got cut down, you could be potentially handing out something like 3 or 4 d6 mortal wounds worth of damage outputs to everyone around, and I feel like that could be well worth 2 CP. You could even play some fun games with it if it was say on its last legs and just about to die. You could even deliberately charge it into something that will kill it when it will die somewhere with absolutely optimal effects. Could be game changing to hand out something like 6 d6 mortal wounds out of one dead riptide. Next up for one command point there's Stim Injectors, also stolen from Cao Yon which got replaced by a different stratagem. This one has a battlesuit get a reactive 6 plus feel no pain when it's shot or attacked in the fight phase. I feel like this one's a bit weak for 1 CP really, a plus 20% durability boost at best. For smaller battlesuits facing really big multi damage weapons it might amount to less than that. I'm not convinced that this one's usually going to be worth it for one command point. Against certain attacks you might even be better just spending a command point reroll on rerolling an invulnerable save or something like that rather than this. Next up for one command point there's the Arrowcon protocol which interestingly enough is probably named after Arrowcon from the Farsight Enclaves 8 but they have managed to misspell the name of the poor guy. In any case he was known for his anti-infantry weaponry and this stratagem gives you sustained hits 1 for a battlesuit unit against units with models of 6 or more and then sustained hits 2 against units of 11 or more, depending on the target and how powerful a battlesuit unit you can use it on. It seems okay but not really standout. I guess the sustained hits 2 is where the real value is. I guess it could be perhaps handy enough on some star side battlesuits with the burst cannons. I guess 24 shots with sustained hits 2 should make a big dent in enemy hordes there. Finally, for one command point, there's the Grav Inhibitor field. You trigger this one when a battlesuit unit is declared as the target of a charge. An enemy must immediately test Battleshock and roll 1d6 for each one of their models. For each 6 that you roll, they take 1 mortal wound. Again, not overly convinced by this really. If you're being charged by a unit of 10, then that's around about 1 or 2 mortal wounds there on average, so not exactly standout. I guess the Battleshock test might occasionally be meaningful if it's going to make the difference between the enemy stopping you scoring an objective or them doing so. Or maybe doing things like a command point reroll for the charge even. Battleshock's kind of unreliable though, so probably not the best just to spend literally for that. Overall I feel like there's two really good stratagems. At Torch Star Gambit, move shoot move one feels like by far the most value per command point out of any of them. I feel like that's just going to be used virtually all the time with that. Otherwise the shortened blaze for the close range deep strike seems great with things like fusion suits. One good way to get them there with AP5 and Strength 10 Fusion Blasters, which seems scary. Otherwise, the rest just feel like there's sort of marginal value for the points, maybe in the right situation, or if you just need every iota of damage or durability in one given situation. Finally, for the Retaliation Cadre, there's four enhancements. Again, as you'd expect, these are all battlesuit only, so they're going to be taken on the Enforcer or Cold Star Commanders. First up, we've got the Pure Tide Engram Neuro Chip for 25 points. This allows you to be able to use the same stratagem on the bearer's unit even if it's already been used this phase. That's nice enough to spam one thing. I feel like in this detachment you use the torch star gambit on multiple units. So you could have multiple units of jump shoot jump crisis suits which does sound kind of fun. I bear in mind that you still have to pay full cost for the stratagems though. So while the flexibility is pretty nice it will be at the expense of whatever else you might have spent that command point on. 
plus the points cost that you paid for this enhancement in the first place. Another fun one is the Starflare Ignition System. This one's listed at 20 points. This one's a return to reserves mechanic that triggers at the end of the enemy turn. You remove the bearer's units from the board and place it in strategic reserve if they weren't in engagement range. And then usually they'll be able to come down the next turn in deep strike again, likely drawing a bead on another target. I feel like this one's really quite a nice one, having a crisis suit unit being able to jump on and off the board at will and always get perfect line of sight on something and also threaten to do things like drop in for secondary objectives. Seems like a pretty good upgrade there. Next up, there's the internal grenade rack for 30 points. The bear against the grenades keyword and if you move over an enemy unit with a normal move then it's 66 and for each 4 plus you get one mortal wound. I guess this one is one to go for on the cold star commander given that he moves 12 inches rather than 8 and while this means that you kind of have to start close already and not either advance or fall back it does have some potential. You could potentially move across in the movement phase, drop some bombs, throw a grenade stratagem for 1 CP and then even use Torch Star Protocol if you had an extra command point on board. That's been an average of 9 mortal wounds on one enemy unit, which is kind of mad. Never mind any actual shooting that the Crisis unit does. I'd guess at 30 points and having to be right by the enemy, it's probably not really quite worth the setup for it. Maybe it could be an alright points filler, I suppose. Finally, for a cheaper 15 points, we've got the Prototype Weapon System. The various ranged weapons can either choose sustained or lethal hits each time you're selected to shoot, and this does seem like it's really quite a good boost to a commander. They can still take 4 weapons, such as 4 missile pods or 4 fusion blasters. Either of those boosts, depending on what they're shooting, is going to add to their damage output, and for 15 points I think it's usable. I think out of these ones, probably my favourite one is the Star Flare Ignition System for 20 points. I think that one seems like it adds the most overall value. And otherwise I feel like all the rest are at least usable. Maybe the prototype weapon system could be a particularly good points filler if you just have 15 points left in a list and don't have anything else to spend it on. Overall I feel like it's an interesting detachment, maybe carried a bit by just a few key rules as opposed to the slightly filler stratagems. The detachment rule has an interesting damage buff though maybe it isn't crazily standout. I feel like the big jump shoot jump all over the shop is the biggest selling point perhaps. 3 inch deep strike is rather nice, and jumping on and off the board with that star flare enhancement it seems good to me. Next up though, we've got the hot headed surgical strike of Montcar, the hyper aggressive tower tactical philosophy delivering a killing blow to the heart of the enemy force. The detachment rule for this one is kind of the counterpart to the Kaoyon detachment. It gives you big damage boosts towards the start of the game. For battle rounds 1 to 3, it gives you lethal hits on all your ranged weapons which really is a massive boost, particularly to mid or lower strength weapons. It's kind of an alright damage buff against things that you're wounding on 3s anyway, but anything that you're wounding on 4s, 5s or 6s, it just makes every unit far more threatening against them. I feel like armies like Imperial and Chaos Knights won't really want to run into this detachment, and I guess it might help out other mid strength things like plasma rifles and fusion blasters on the crisis suits, maybe Riptide Ion Accelerators. And coming early in the game compared with Kaoyon I think is an advantage. In general it's maybe a bit more important the damage you do on round 2 say versus round 4. The other boost that the detachment gives is the assault keyword which you get for guided units in this detachment. I did see a bit of rumbling about whether or not that works rules as written with the for the greater good rule. I feel like the intent of it is perfectly clear though. And if there is indeed any error then I'm sure they'll patch it. This bit of the rule doesn't seem locked to turns 1 to 3 at all, so this one's just all game. Guided units get the assault keyword. It's really quite a big mobility boost with anything worthy enough to guide, meaning that you won't have to compromise between, say, moving to objectives or advancing to get lines of sight or range and things. An extra D6 inch movement on anything that needs it is really quite big. You would have to certainly think about what units you're guiding in the movement phase, though, which definitely adds a small bit of extra complexity. I guess it might slightly lessen dependency on cold style battle suits with their rule as leaders. I guess perhaps you could see a few more enforcers if they get this rule easily. Overall between those two things though it does look like a pretty great core rule to me. A meaningful damage boost and assault on all of your big guns throughout most of the game. I feel like this is a very easy one to get extra value out of. Otherwise for stratagems there's a few interesting damage or mobility ones. For one command point there's pinpoint counter offensive. 
a non-crew unit gets destroyed by an enemy unit, and then for the rest of the battle, other non-crew units get to be roll hit rolls against that unit that destroyed your target. So basically a pretty massive damage boost against the thing that destroyed your unit from then on. Ideally you'd want to use that on something that's a big scary destructive enemy unit, say a big squad of Terminators, an Imperial Knight or similar. It might overlap a bit with some datasheet abilities such as Tetra's or Stealth Suit's guiding I suppose, but still I think that that's quite a good boost. Next there's one command point for aggressive mobility, this one's a battle tactic so you can get it free with Farsight, spoiler alert. This one just allows you to auto advance 6 inches, pretty handy given that the detachment can hand out assault weapons. And I think the auto advance is pretty powerful to be able to guarantee things like say reaching certain objectives in the midfield or getting range or line of sight on something that you need a big advance roll for. Maybe not the most exciting stratagem in the world and ideally you'd want to try and put yourself in the positions where you don't have to use it but realistically in game auto advance 6 inches does come in handy and sometimes it's going to be absolutely worth it. For one command point next there's focused fire, again a battle tactic one. This one allows two Tau units shooting against one enemy unit to get plus one AP to their weapons, though it does come at the restrictions that you can only use it in the first three battle rounds as per Monkar, and both of your units can only target that nominated unit, so no splitting fire with secondary weapons or anything like that. Again, reasonable enough for one CP I think, given that Tau units often tend to work in pairs with guided units, that might not be the biggest loss in the world to sacrifice the spotter unit's firepower, even if it's into something slightly suboptimal. I guess the dream would be to have this on two scary firepower units both shooting into the same really big meaningful target. Overall seems pretty strong though, you could say have some AP4 Skyray missile launchers firing at long range. That could be quite a nice one against vehicles in cover with armour of contempt and the like. Next up for one command point there's combat debarkation. This one allows you to reroll wound rolls against the closest target for a unit that just got out of a transport, usually a devilfish. I do like the way as well that it does specify an infantry unit as well, just in case you wanted to use this out of something crazy like a manta I suppose. Overall this one does look like quite a fun one though, it really is quite a good damage boost to just about any unit. It looks pretty great for rail rifles and iron rifles on pathfinders in particular I think. Could be an argument to use those in a devilfish over breaches I suppose. Could also be a fallback option for breaches as well. They can get reroll wound rolls but only if they shoot at something on an objective. This could be a way to get that reliably. Next up for 2cp there's pulse onslaught. Again it's a non-crude infantry unit and this time shooting against something that isn't a monster or vehicle. And the stratagem debuffs their movement with a minus 2 to move, advance and charge. Again this feels like it would have been a very good stratagem if it had been one command point. That's quite a nice debuff to hand out and occasionally it could be worth it to keep something really powerful out of the game. It still could be worth it on occasion for 2 CP I think. But it would have to be pretty game changing expending those resources on it compared with other things. Maybe if your opponent's got something like a big slow unit of Death Guard Death Shroud Terminators making them move 2 inches and then charge 5 on average could be a good way to keep them out of the game if you can't destroy them this turn. Finally for stratagems for 2 CP there's counterfire defence systems. This one's minus 1 damage in the enemy shooting phase for 1 unit and again it's really quite a pricey defensive buff here. I guess probably going to be best against big multi wound units that are getting hit by damage 2 weapons in particular. Halving the damage output of that would be nice. But again this is one that would have been really quite nice at one command point and get used a lot. Nowhere near as good value at two I think. Overall though between all that I don't think it's a bad stratagem section at all. The pinpoint counter offensive one it seems like it's a really good one to use when the enemy's big scary units inevitably kill some of your stuff. Auto advance definitely does come in handy and perhaps more often than you might think. Focused fire is usable for the extra AP so is combat debarkation. And the last two have to be in the right situation given the 2 CP but aren't unusable. Finally for Montcar we've got the enhancements. First up Exemplar of Montcar allows your units to still get lethal hits on the 4th battle round as well. This one feels like it's the inverse of the Exemplar of Kaoyon in that detachment to get things early in battle round 2 but honestly far less useful. Generally far more useful to get something early rather than extra late. I guess it's cheap if you need a points filler though. Strike Swiftly is 25 points. This one gives 2 units within 6 inches of the bearer scout. 
This one I'll be a lot more positive about. Getting two units to move up the board and be more threatening seems to work pretty well with the lethal hits and mobility tricks that the detachment has. You could aim to perhaps have something infiltrating in the midfield to make sure they could get that scout move and plan to take up some real estate in the middle of the board, hiding in a big line of sight blocking ruin maybe. Strategic Conqueror is 15 points. This one nominates an objective marker at the start of the first battle round. While the bearers on the board, you add plus one to the objective control of any models of yours trying to take that point. It certainly would make one objective a bit easier to take. It's only relevant if it's contested by the enemy, though. That certainly doesn't hurt to have. I feel like for a points filler, this one's going to be far more valuable than Exemplar of Montcar. It means that you could potentially muscle the enemy off objectives with some really quite light units, potentially. Finally, for 20 points, there's Coordinated Exploitation. Again, this one is not for crews. If this model acts as an observer, their guided unit also gets sustained hits 1 as well, as well as the normal boost for that. No one feels like it could be okay on a backfield, ethereal or fireblaze, maybe in a strike team squad. I feel like this one's maybe a bit of a weird one in that the enhancement's quite good, but it's a bit of a struggle to think exactly where you'd want to put it and the entire setup be actually efficient. Overall though, I feel like the Montcar detachment does have a whole ton of power, the detachment special rule is probably the biggest draw to the entire thing. Lethal hits and assault for a whole bunch of units in the first few turns is great. I think that lots of the stratagems are helpful as well. The reroll ones to punish enemies when they destroy your units is nice. Most of the rest are at least usable or interesting. And out of these enhancements, I perhaps like the scouts one more than the rest out of anything. The objective control one could definitely be helpful. And the other two could be alright for points fillers or a marking sort of unit. Next up, and on to some auxiliaries, where we have the Crute Hunting Pack, the Crute Detachment within the Codex. This one gets three different detachment rules essentially. Hunter's Instincts in a damage boost, Skirmish Fighters for some invulnerable saves, and Crute Carnivores get to be battle line. The damage boost is quite a nice one for chipping damage off enemy units and then making them easier to damage from there. You get a plus one to hit units below starting strength, and if you do get to attack anything below half strength, you get a plus one to wound to really capitalise on damage you've already done. The plus one to hit is far more easy to trigger, and I feel like it's going to have a bit of incentive to just doing a little bit of scattergun damage in the enemy army before you fire with your big hitters. And if you are backing up the crew with some Tau guns, it might mean that you want to fire some Tau units first to do some chip damage before going with the crew units that can then use this rule on anything that you hurt. Should be easy to trigger on single model units or anything with one wound. Multi wound, multi model units might take a few more wounds before they technically count as below starting strength. But in general, it's going to trigger quite a lot as you can make contact with the enemy. I treat the plus one to hit as the main bit, and the plus one to wound nice to have on occasion, though I wouldn't plan for it. The defensive boost is skirmish fighters for a five plus invulnerable save against ranged attacks and a six plus against melee. Again, this one is a pretty spectacular rule to hand out to an army full of things with low saves. It does make crew carnivores genuinely somewhat difficult to just gun off the table compared with what they are. They do have stealth as well, which means you minus one to hit and then saving a good chunk of them with this, as opposed to minus one to hit and then almost get no save whatsoever. Pretty nice for crew toxes as well to be able to bounce off last cannons one third of the time. Finally, crew carnivores having battle line does make sense. They did get to be objective control 2 now, and they've got lots of support from stratagems. I think it would certainly make sense to have a fair amount of them. If you want to make mass crew hordes work, then this feels like the place to do so. For stratagems, as you'd expect, they're all locked to crew, though a few of them are quite powerful as a result. The single best one by quite a bit, I think, is Hidden Hunters. One command point for any crew unit that the enemy declared shooting against can't be shot if it's greater than 12 inches away, and he can keep this in reserve until the enemy has selected targets with any one unit. These stratagems are really disruptive and powerful in whatever army they have basically, really mess around with gun lines. Could be great to keep some objective holders alive and mean that your opponent can't do anything about them. Could be really big for protecting a key damage dealer like those crew tox rampages. Pretty intimidating that you could have a genuinely pretty threatening melee unit just charging up the board, and then just say no to a critical turn of enemy shooting before they make the lines. Next up, a grizzly feast is used when a crew unit kills an enemy in the fight phase. In the opponent's next command phase, any enemy units within 6 inches must test battle shock, taking a minus 1 to the test if they're below half strength. 
This one's been somewhat reinterpreted from the crude carnivore special rule. Looks like their meat-eating ways are realised here and for the Flesh Shaper. I do think that Battleshock is still kind of super unreliable to spend a command point for. The time that you normally use this will be if this has a genuine chance to deny the opponent primary objective points. Say you kill something that isn't on an objective, but you're within range of the enemy unit that's holding one objective. It could perhaps give you a coin flip's chance to take them off that objective and deny them some critical victory points. Most of the time though, I wouldn't say that kind of randomness is really worth spending CP on though, sadly. Next up, another fun one is two command points to join the hunt. This one you use on Crute Infantry or Crute Hounds, and when the unit gets slain, you get to put an identical unit back into Strategic Reserve. The optimal target for that looks like it is the Crute Carnivores and a squad of 20 of them. Potentially 100 points just plonked back into Strategic Reserve, having another whole group of high objective control, strength 4 chaff, turn up on the peripheries of the enemy army somewhere. I guess if you're trying to make some sort of crazy Crute Horde list work, with anything up to 180 Kroot bodies on the table between carnivores, fast orcas and hounds, this could be a way to add another 20 bodies to the mix. I feel like that would be at least somewhat annoying for some enemy armies to cut through, given the invulnerable saves and the minus one to hit. I can't help but think that it might be a bit of a swing as to whether or not they make their charge when they arrive though. They're odds on not to, and without it they're not getting to any objectives that turn. And while they do have a fair bit of strength for volume fire, it might not be enough to clear any one enemy unit that's got some sort of high armor save. For 1 CP, there's a trap well laid. You can use this in either the shooting or the fight phase, and after one crew unit has attacked that phase against an enemy unit, whenever other crews attack that same enemy unit, their weapons get AP-1 better. I think it's far easier to trigger in the shooting phase. You could maybe shoot a lone spear at the squad and get the reroll hits buff. And then for the rest of the shooting phase, all your crew rifles and things could be an extra AP minus one and re-rolling hits against that target. Does seem like it could be a stacking buff that gives them a surprising chance of punching up a bit. It's maybe a bit harder to coordinate in the fight phase given that you'd have to be charging two units into one target. I feel like it could be genuinely meaningful on the crew tops rampages in a big unit of them. One of their main issues is that they're pretty low AP against anything with a 2 plus or a 3 plus save. That's going to give them a lot more meaningful damage there. Maybe if you could coordinate their charge with a unit of, say, a crew hounds or something, then that could be kind of worth it. Next up, there's a 1 command point 1 called EMP Grenades. Weirdly enough, this one's used in the enemy shooting phase and it applies to a crew grenades unit, so the infantry or the rampagers. The vehicle that was just about to shoot or fight gets minus one weapon skill and minus one ballistic skill if they're within eight inches of that crew squad. And maybe a bit underenthused about that one, it's very positional and minus one to hit is alright, but it isn't crazy. I guess it's the one to use if you've got a great big Titanic Knight using a whole bunch of shooting on you. And I guess one interesting point is that it can actually stack with the stealth special rule as this rule affects weapon skill and ballistic skill, not the actual dice roll, so it's not capped by the minus one modifiers thing. Finally, for one command point, there's Guerrilla Warriors. This one allows you to fall back, shoot and charge, declared in the movement phase. I feel like this one's just a generally handy stratagem option to have that might just occasionally be well worth it in-game in situational things. Seems like it could be another one of interest for those Krutox Rampagers. If you fall back, then you can make sure that you get absolutely optimal impact hits with their mortal wounds when they charge in again, so it could be worth a fair bit of damage there, and also trigger lance on their blades. I feel like for the regular crews it might be a bit more situational, as a lot of things just mess them up in melee really quite quickly, particularly with only 6 plus invulnerable saves and no minus 1 to hit there. Could occasionally be a big deal though, if enough of them survive intact to be meaningful. Plus could allow you to do things like secondary objectives, maybe falling back and doing a cleanse action perhaps. Finally for the hunting pack, we've got their enhancements. For 10 points, there's root carved weapons. This one gives you precision and devastating wounds to all Warshaper weapons. This one seems to be far more relevant on the dart bow shooting, given that it's good range and gets anti-infantry 3 plus, means that you could be pretty reliably handing out devastating wounds if there are enemy infantry about. I'd say that if you are taking a war shaper, then this is a really quite reasonable include on them. It makes his damage go from pretty underwhelming to genuinely kind of interesting. The Borthrog Gland is 15 points, and this one's Flesh Shaper only. This one gives you critical hits on a 5+. plus. 
The Flesh Shaper's enhancement is to give you sustained hits 1 to melee weapons for your unit. I guess the maximum amount of melee weapons that you could use would be recruit carnivores in a big squad of 20 or something when they're charging in. I guess with this active you're getting a big plus 50% damage out of them, potentially more if you've got other buffs going on. I feel like this would have been far more impactful and meaningful if the Flesh Shaper had given them lethal hits rather than sustained. Next up for 10 points there's the Crute Hawk Flock. This one's again really quite cheap and easy enough to include. The bearer's unit's ranged weapons get to ignore cover which is alright, and also you get to deny the enemy dropping reinforcements anywhere within 12 inches of the bearer. Really quite nice for defending home objectives, helps with screening in general, and it does counter things like those 3 inch drop type units like we had in the retaliation cadre. At least on paper this one does look really quite interesting with a lone spear defending your home objective. He's a lone operative so you can't shoot him greater than 12 inches away. And you can also keep him safe from enemy deep strikers who can also have to drop at least 12 inches away. And if they do then they can't shoot him. Finally there's the Nomadic Hunter for 20 points. This one's the Trail Shaper one and it gives him a plus 3 inch movement and grants the assault keywords to the weapons in the unit. This one's a fairly pricey one but it does give you super speedy crew. They scout 7 inches, so with this extra movement buff they'll then move forward 10 inches, 17 inch movement off your deployment lines on the first turn. Certainly potentially could be charging the enemy in their own deployment zone from turn 1 if you roll high enough and definitely reaching enemy midfield units. It is the priciest of the lot though and you're still ultimately just delivering a whole bunch of strength 4 AP0 weapons. Often with those sort of things it doesn't make sense to overinvest too much. Overall between all this though I feel like there's enough interesting stuff to genuinely make this detachment interesting. We'll talk through the new crew units profiles in just a second but the detachment rule I think does what it needs to, genuinely adds some threat to the army and some defence which crews are sorely lacking for otherwise. Hidden Hunters is as usual an amazing disruptive stratagem particularly when you've got loads of chaff units running around. Join the hunt seems fun to recycle 20 crews if your opponent destroys them too early. And fallback shoot and charge is useful. I feel like I'm maybe a little bit more mis on the enhancements here. I feel like the crew characters already feel like a bit of an overinvestment in the units that they're leading to start with, but they definitely add some interest. For 10 points, that crew talk flock I think does seem like a good deal, however you use it though. I certainly use the root carved weapons if you did want to take a war shaper. And the other two aren't super expensive at least, could be justified if you wanted to play a unit a bit more unusually. Overall I feel like perhaps the way to actually play this detachment in the strongest form would be not to go all crew. Obviously you want them as a massive great big chunk of your army given all the support that they get, but they just do some roles really well and some roles not so great. If you combine this with a bunch of scary tower firepower, particularly things that can handle heavy tanks, you could potentially have a really quite interesting army with the crew doing sneaky objective things and bullying lighter infantry, the tower trying to take down the heavies. Finally for the detachments we have Kao Yon, the philosophy of the patient hunter, lying in ambush to hit the enemy hard when the time is right. This one was the index detachment for Codex Tau Empire, and it does have a few changes since the index. Some stratagems went to other detachments and an enhancement was also changed, but there's some new stratagems to replace it. This one gives you a big damage boost towards the end of the battle. The Kao Yon rule gives you sustained hits 1 to all your ranged weapons on battle round 3+, plus, so that would be a big 33% damage increase for all your units that aren't guided when they're shooting, but it goes up to sustained hits 2 against spotted units, so for a guided unit there that would be plus 50% damage compared with battle rounds 1 and 2. It does look like there's a small change in the wording there, changing from giving the sustained hits 2 to a guided unit to against spotted units, I guess that means that you don't get sustained hits too for Gynas units shooting against other targets. I'm honestly not 100% clear as to whether or not that would give the observing unit sustained hits too against that same spotted unit. My guess is that that probably wouldn't have been the intention of the change, but look forward to hearing your thoughts on that down in the comments below. I'll try and post a pinned comment if I've seen anything else more interesting about that. In any case though, regardless of rule subtleties, it's a very strong army-wide damage boost. Hitting on a 3 plus with sustained hits too is a massive boost to guided units, and it really does actually feel like a rule that favours you to play fluffy with this one, trying to hide at least a fair amount of your damage dealers until late game, 
to jump forward with some obscene damage output and capitalise hard. I feel like it does mean that you'd have to strike a fairly careful balance though. You can't afford to do absolutely nothing in the first couple of turns, otherwise you're going to lose anyway. But you don't want to overcommit so much that the battle's already half decided by the time that you get your big damage boosts. Going through the carry on stratagems, and as mentioned, two of the stratagems have been sobbed out. Stim Injectors, the 6 plus Fail No Pain one, and Strike and Fade both essentially went to the Retaliation cadre. Kind of a shame for Strike and Fade, given that that was one of the single most popular stratagems, allowing you to move, shoot, move Crisis suits. Instead, though, they have been replaced by two fairly good ones, in my opinion, these two here. One command point for Attempting Trap, which is a battle tactic stratagem. You get to nominate one midfield objective. For the rest of that phase, any enemy units are plus one to wound on that objective. A really quite powerful big debuff there. Though it does mean that if you use it again, it must be on the same objective. And you also can only use it on battle round three or more. So no using this for early damage. I think the strategy itself is really quite powerful. By turn three, the opponent's definitely going to be having important units on objectives to score. It is a big deal that you could just absolutely light up one tough target with half your army getting plus one to wound if it's necessary to take down something really big and scary. Though the main advantage like the rest of Kalyon is that it comes slightly late game. Definitely feels like one to consider turn three though. The other new one is one command point for Wall of Mirrors, reimagining a ninth edition ability I believe. This one allows a stealth unit, a ghost kill or shadow sun to do the return to strategic reserves trick. This one triggered at the end of the enemy turn. And you're not allowed to use this if you're in engagement range as per multiple similar rules in other codexes. This one's genuinely a useful trick to have in the army if you can get it though. Means that at the end of the enemy turn you can take a look at your units, decide if any of them are particularly out of position or could be used to go back into reserve and maybe threaten to drop for secondaries or jump round behind the enemy army, take down fragile things that they don't want attacked or just otherwise cause problems and keep the units relevant late game. I do feel like this one's quite a good one and will be a better incentive to run some of those units. I feel like all three of them are really quite strong at the moment, particularly with the stealth suit change. Otherwise, and largely unchanged since the index, are coordinate to engage, a battle tactic to give your observer unit the benefits of being guided pretty much, getting plus one ballistic skill and ignores clover if they have a marker light. I guess maybe a situationally useful one if you don't have small units that can spot and your spotty unit is a big dangerous damage dealer in its own right. Could be alright, though ideally I think you'd want to have other units spotting for your big stuff if possible. For one command point, there's point blank ambush. When you shoot a unit, you get an extra AP1 if you're within 9 inches. Always good just to be able to turn on a little bit more AP. Can be good against certain armies out there, like custodies in cover for example. And kind of similar to the tempting trap one, you can't use this battle round 1 or battle round 2. Limiting it to when your ambush gets sprung at turn 3 onwards. Next up for one command point there's photon grenades. A grenade unit that gets charged is minus 2 to charge and also the enemy takes a battle shock test. The charge debuff is genuinely meaningful if the enemy is trying to charge you out of 9 inch reserve for example. You're going to decrease that from a slim chance to almost no chance. Though perhaps for more middling charges I feel like it's maybe not quite as good as it sounds. Every time it does genuinely save a unit, it's going to be pretty immense, but there's a lot of the time that your opponent might have just failed the charge anyway, or will pass it even regardless of this, so it's not really one that gives you reliable value. Finally, for one command point, there's Combat Embarkation, a nice mirror of the Montcar Combat Debarkation. This one allows a unit to re-embark within a transport within 3 inches in reaction to an enemy charge. Theoretically really quite nice for something like breaches that just jumped out of a devilfish onto a midfield objective. If the opponent moves a scary unit up to wipe them out in close combat, they can retreat to safety back within the tank, hopefully for another round of shooting when they jump out again. Kind of similar to that nice Montcar stratagem, it makes maybe infantry and transports just a little bit more tempting in Kalyon and Montcar compared with elsewhere. Finally we've got the carry-on enhancements, a few of which have different printed costs in the codex versus the index points. Exemplar of carry-on was a really commonly played one for battle suits in the index version. It gives you early carry-on on battle round 2, so that could be say some sort of commander leading a squad of crisis suits and all their scary guns getting sustained hits too on a turn 2 deep strike. Hard to go too far wrong with a plus 50% damage boost and that's a unit that can certainly get stuck in early. 
it is maybe a little bit less auto include and massive impact for given that crisis suits now only have two guns and squads of three. I still think it could be pretty reasonable though if you did have some deep strikers. Precision of the patient hunter is 15 points, which was 20 points before. This one's plus one to hit for commanders that hit on a three plus already, so hitting on a two normally, and then going up to plus one to wound from battle round three. I think that the plus one to wound is the better buff of the two, given that you might already be hitting on a two plus anyway if you're guided, but either way it seems okay as a points filler. Probably not going to absolutely change the world, but you do get a commander's weapons really quite scary late game. I guess if you wanted multiple units of crisis suits dropping, you could have one deep strike in with the exemplar of Cao Yon turn 2, and then another one deep strike in with this turn 3. Next up, we've got the solid image projection unit. This is 30 points, and it replaced the pure tide engram neuro chip, which went to the retaliation card. This one is one of those rules that allows you to redeploy three units, and you can either shift them around on the board or put them into strategic reserve but it is done before first turn is known. I feel like this one's really not awful for 30 points, just being able to nudge a few units to make the most out of your first turn confrontations, make sure things are hidden if you're going second, but make sure that they're threatening if you're going first. Could be kind of impactful with infiltrator style units as well, if you find that they're a bit out deployed, and you could make them a little bit safer from enemies in their backfield. Finally, there's through unity devastation, 25 points in the codex, 20 points pre-codex, this one's not for Kroot. Again, this one's kind of similar to Montcar. If the unit observes, it can grant a guided unit lethal hit in addition to the normal benefits. Fairly impactful that that could be guiding something like a crisis suit unit with a commander or a riptide or something. Could be something fairly meaningful to get lethal hits on. Maybe something in the backfield like an ethereal or a fireblade with a strike team or a sniper drone team perhaps. Overall, mostly seem pretty usable. I still think the exemplar of Cao Yon is probably going to be the best out of any of them. Seems pretty nice to get a big damage punch nice and early. Overall, I feel like there's going to be a lot of hype around people wanting to try out the various other detachments that the Tau have got to offer, but I still feel like the Cao Yon detachment is going to be at least interesting. Sustained hits too is a massive damage boost, even if you get it late. A couple of the added in stratagems have got pretty good value between Attempting Trap and Wall of Mirrors. I do feel like a lot of people are going to be more excited to try out some of the new stuff with the early game rush damage, even if this still has some good options. Overall, I feel like they haven't really done too badly with the detachments. As mentioned before, I was kind of surprised that we only got four of them compared with more that the other codexes got, but they all seem at least usable. Monkar feels like quite an exciting and general purpose one with all those lethal hits. I'm sure there'll be some people keen to try and make some all battle suit builds work with the retaliation cadre. I feel like that's maybe just carried by a few key rules like the jump shoot, jump, close drop and the proper detachment rule as well. I feel like the Kroot hunting pack is actually kind of interesting. Have say half the army of Kroot and then get some just big hitting damage dealers to fill out the rest. If you don't want to embrace the alien auxiliaries and the full Kroot meme army to the max. Moving on, let's talk through the Tau datasheet roster. There's 38 of them, up by one compared with pre-codex, though given the big Kroot range release that the Tau got, there has been a fair bit of datasheet turnover. All in all, we've gained 6 datasheets, but lost 5. Not the best news for people who had those models. One of the biggest and perhaps most impactful changes of the codex is splitting the crisis battle suits into 3 datasheets. We'll focus on them first out of the datasheets, but there's the Sunforge, Fire Knife, and Star Scythe configurations, all of which are separate units now. Apparently, mixed loadout crisis suits will eventually get a Legends datasheet to represent them, which means that you could still use them in game, though it does mean that they're essentially mothballed and no longer going to be supported. On top of that, unit size has been cut down and war gear is less flexible, airbursts and cyclic ion blasters are gone, and we'll talk about a few more changes in a second. In any case, that accounts for two of the new datasheets, the one unit of crisis suits replaced by three versions of them. Otherwise, the rest of the new datasheets are all crude. The standard shaper has been split into three types of datasheets, the trail shaper, war shaper, and flesh shaper, all of which can give different boosts to their crude carnivore kin. Tau have acquired themselves an actually genuinely quite threatening melee unit in the Krutox Rampages. Kind of fun to have that kind of counter charge threat in an army that's not known for its close combat. And there's also the new cavalry Krut Lone Spear, a chameleonic rider that can help buff the rest of his army. 
Games Workshop both gives and takes away though. As per the Codex previews, we knew that five data sheets were going, and now we know what they are. As expected, three of the fine cast character models are just outright gone. Ornvar, the Space Pope, with his Honor Guard here. Ornshi, the Ethereal, with the Cool Blade from Violar, I believe. And Commander Longstrike, the Hammerhead Commander, usually functioning as a slightly upgraded Hammerhead tank. Kind of sad that they chose to remove these rather than replace them with new plastic kits. Lots of people enjoyed using Longstrike. I feel like Ornvar was actually a fairly interesting competitive unit, even if all he really did was be very tough to kill and have lone operative things going on. Plus does feel like a kind of central figure to the Tau army being the ethereal in chief, even if he is Lord Dead I believe. The other two losses were two other kits that didn't really have a dedicated plastic kit just to themselves. The commander in crisis battle suit is gone. You now just use the Cold Star or Enforcer data sheets. So if you do have an XV8 Crisis Commander, I just use him as one of those. It does mean that you do have less options for buffs of the unit he's leading though. Finally, the Tactical Drone Squad are completely gone. They were the only way that you could field independent drone squads and actually have them count as individual models as opposed to just war gear. I feel like maybe it wasn't the worst move in the world to de-emphasize drones as the main way to get loads of value out of Tau. They did feel a bit dominant in certain editions in the past. I feel like it wouldn't have been the worst thing to keep them around as little auxiliary units to help out in the peripherous. At least competitively speaking, compared with pre-codex, they aren't the most enormous loss as Games Workshop decided to basically price them out of all relevancy with a crazily overinflated 70 point cost per four of them. That means that there's a few survivors that were on the perhaps concern list. The Tide Wall data sheets remain with the Tower Fortifications. The Vespid remain, which I think was really on the cards anyway, but there was at least some worry given that they weren't updated and had a fine cast kit. And the same sort of thing for the Firesight Marksman Sniper Drone team. Again, a resin model that needs a plastic update. It means that him and the Vespid, I believe, are the last resin miniatures in the Tower range now. Overall, never the most fun when some data sheets get moved away. I wouldn't be too surprised if some of them wind up getting Legends data sheets. Ornvar seems like a particularly likely one, and I guess you could just use their prior data sheets from the index in more casual games. I guess most of the rest can at least be proxied or used in different ways. Ornshi as a regular ethereal, Longstrike as a hammerhead, the Crisis Battle Suit as a different type of commander, and tactical drones in squads. Otherwise, getting into the tower data sheets proper, there's definitely some big themes of the army. Their battle line units are the strike team and the breacher team, so the fire warriors that you can take lots of if you want, though in general most people tend to take more limited amounts. The crew carnivores remain not battle line for most tower armies, though if you take that hunting pack detachment then you can take more of them. As mentioned at the start of 10th edition, drones remain no longer models, but are more war gear upgrades for different units out there, adding extra wounds or extra guns and things. The base leadership is broadly 7 plus for the army, so a little bit more likely to fail battle shock than some I guess. Most tower units hit on a 4 plus at range, which is generally not the best for an army that's all about futuristic high tech weapons I think. It means they absolutely do need to use guiding to make them efficient in the shooting phase. And as per the memes, Tower really not an army that want to be getting into melee if you can possibly avoid it, at least for almost all of their units. The common battlesuit units in the army function as vehicles besides a couple like Shadow Sun and the stealth suits. It means that even if they get engaged then they should still be able to turn around and shoot the enemy in the face with big guns never tire, even if they're minus one to hit. The vehicle keyword does mean that they might have to go around things like ruins and terrain, as opposed to ghosting straight through if they were infantry. Just in general for the army, they tend to be an army of mobile heavy firepower. Not really all that durable per individual model, and typically needs to play at least a little bit cagey, balancing destroying the enemy with their fancy guns and staying safe from enemy charges compared with the need to move forward and take objectives which you need to be able to do in 10th edition. For going through the data sheets, I thought we'd focus on the new ones first, talk through the crisis suits and then go through the entire crew section of the army, then talk through all the rest of the data sheets, highlighting their drones and any major changes first. Starting out with those crisis suits though, one of the biggest changes to the entire codex was that they're split into three different units, with some maybe quite surprising and weird restrictions on them compared with the massively flexible multi-tool of a unit that they've been before. Chopping them up into three different data sheets does mean that you can field more of them technically, 
Each one of these you can fill three times with the rule of three. Though each individual squad of them now can only be a maximum of three models, they've removed the option to take six suits along. And that is quite a major blow to their power given that both stratagems and characters are going to be less efficient on smaller squads. Their basic stat line is essentially the same. They move 10 inches, have toughness 5, a 3 plus save, 4 wounds, and objective control 2. As mentioned, they count as vehicles, so get to fire in close combat with the big guns never tire keyword. They can deep strike and get a small melee profile with 3 attacks at strength 5. Otherwise though, they have taken hits on a number of different fronts for what sort of gear they can take. You can't mix and match between these data sheets. The Sun Forge gets the fusion blasters and you can't combine that with other weapon options. The Fire Knives are missiles and plasmas and the Star Sires are flamers and burst cannons, making them a lot more specialist units now. Air bursting fragmentation projectors and cyclic ion blasters are both completely gone. Kind of notable given that cyclic ion blasters were the most played option before. And then even for customizability for these already sort of more restricted units, they've taken other hits. You don't get the option to choose between shield generator or weapon support system now or whatever else. It seems that the Sunforge battlesuits have made off with all the shield generators and the other two can't get them. Drones are a bit less flexible as well. You can't just take two shield drones for every single suit now if you wanted. You can't double up between the normal selection of gun, marker and shield. So I guess usually shield and gun is probably going to be the way to go. Maybe throw in one marker if you need these to guide in a pinch. And finally to cap off the nerfs, the plasma rifles have had their range decrease to 18 inches. Still fairly threatening, but not really all that much longer range than a fusion blaster now. That's a bit of a come down for them, given that they were striking out at a big 30 inch range in 9th edition. Overall between all that, crisis suits are smaller, have less weapons, are less hard hitting and less durable. Though that has come at the plus of getting bespoke squad special rules and being able to field more of them in total. Looking at those squads individually, and the Star Scythe Crisis suits get the choice between the Burst Cannons and Flamers. Burst Cannons are 4 shots at strength 5, AP 0, damage 1. Flamers the standard issue ones for 40k. As mentioned, you can double up if you just wanted a massive great big Flamer Overwatch type unit. And their special rule is that you get to improve the AP by 1 if you're not attacking vehicles or monsters, so it'll go through hordes quite nicely. They also get the option to fall back and shoot as well, so there may be a little bit more resilience to skirmishing with enemy infantry that might try and engage them. It looks like they are destined to be the cheapest of the Crisis suits now. This is 140 points in the codex, though it might change when Games Workshop do their digital update. The Fire Knife Crisis suits get the choice of plasma rifles or missile pods. As mentioned, plasma rifles, AP3 and damage 3 shots just to 18 inches, so a bit short range now. The missile pods being the long range crisis option, 30 inches at strength 7, AP1 and damage 2. It seems that these guys thing is hitting with those attacks pretty reliably. They get to re-roll hit rolls of 1 just innately against everything or all hit rolls against things that are at their starting strength. And on top of that, they also get to ignore modifiers to the hit roll, so if the opponent's got stealth or something, then they won't care about that. I guess they're going to be kind of specialist at destroying a sort of medium infantry, either the option that can go for things like terminators with plasma rifles, or have a bit more range than the rest of the other options with missiles. Finally, the Sunforge ones, to my mind, feel like the most scariest. They're listed at 160 points, and they get no gear options, they're just armed with two fusion blasters. They're each a standard melter gun, a single shot at 12 inches, strength 9, AP 4, and damage D6, and getting the melter 2 special rule. They sort of feel like they're going for the same sort of vibe as Space Brain Eradicators now. They get to re-roll the wound roll and the damage roll against monsters and vehicles. And they're also going to be the toughest crisis suit as well, given that they get the shield generator built in for a 4 plus invulnerable save. They could give those big wound and damage rerolls to say a crisis commander attached with quad fusion blasters if they wanted. Basically if these guys do drop within range of an enemy tank or monster, they should have a pretty reasonable chance of destroying it with those special rules going on, plus whatever you can give them with guiding. Overall I feel like there's going to be a lot of people not particularly happy about these changes, though I can kind of see why they do it from a gameplay and design point of view. At least it might stop people just taking cyclic ion blasters as the default loadout on everything. Though I guess that was partly a problem just due to 10th edition's free war gear. Crisis suits really did seem like the sort of unit that would just make more sense to pay different costs for their different war gear. They just work a bit better with that. Moving on next up, I thought we'd go through the Crute, given that they've got loads of new units as well. Starting off, we've got the basic Crute carnivores. 
Pre-Codex, these were 55 points or 110 for 20 of them. And unlike the Crisis suits, they've still retained their max squad size. You can still field 20 of them. They move 7 inches and scout 7 inches pre-game. They're fairly easy to kill with just toughness 3, a 6 plus save, though they do get stealth, so the enemy would be minus 1 to hit them at range. And for damage output, they get 2 attacks within 12 inches at range with a recruit rifle, and 2 attacks hitting a bit better in melee at the same profile. The battle line of the recruit did get a fair few changes in the codex though. They've been increased to objective control 2 versus OC1, so they're really quite a lot better for skirmishing for midfield objectives. And to help them out on the objective front, they've got a new fieldcraft special rule. If you control an objective at the end of your command phase with them, then this gives them essentially the sticky objectives type rule, meaning that that objective will remain yours until your opponent can actually claim it. Quite a big deal if it's worn out in the open and your unit gets shot down off it. Could be quite nice to have a crew unit around just to put that on your home field objective as well. Sometimes it can matter big. Otherwise, beyond the standard crew rifles, they did get a few more bits of interesting gear. One per ten of them can take a Tangle Bomb Launcher, D3 shots at Strength 5, AP 0 and Damage 1, which is a little bit more threatening than the standard crew rifle. It still doesn't compromise the melee of that crew. Otherwise, they've also gained a Sergeant sort of upgrade. He gets a pistol, which the rest don't get, and he can trade his crew rifle for a crew carbine, which is just one shot at Strength 4, AP 0, Damage 2, Feels like a side grade at best there. And finally, if you do have a big squad of 20, you can attach two different shapers to them if you want a bigger, more threatening unit. Probably feels like overinvestment given the initial cost of the shapers as they've been shown off so far. But I guess you could have interesting things like a faster unit with a trail shaper with that upgrade, plus make them mightier with the flesh shaper. Overall, seem interesting enough chaff though, particularly in the crude detachment. Fieldcraft is handy. And just having a whole bunch of objective control 2 bodies in the midboard right from turn 1 seems helpful enough, even if they're not very tough outside of their own detachment. The crew veteran unit are the fast stalkers. These ones get you 12 models for 70 points pre-codex. You get the 10 crew guys and then 2 crew hounds attached to the squad. They haven't really seen any major codex changes. The only small change is they lost the pulse carbine option. The Tau pulse rifle is now just referred to as a Tau tech rifle to just consolidate those profiles. Otherwise, for their core damage and defense, they're pretty much the same as the regular crudes, but get infiltrate. They get a bit of fun special gear, either a sort of flamer-styled Dvorjite Skinner or a Londaxi Tribalist. Their sergeant punches a bit harder with a ritual blade. Their shooting ignores cover due to the Pekra bird that they get along with them. And their bounty hunter rule allows them to get lethal hits and precision against one marked target at the start of the game. Though overall I still feel like they all add up to just a somewhat general purpose unit that can bully infantry and costs a bit more than the regular crews. Might be competing against stealth suits for the infiltrate style role from the rest of the codex I guess. Getting into new crew units and next up we have those crew shocks rampages. Young and ferocious crew cavalry with 3-6 to six models per unit. Points will be determined when they do their digital updates but there are 130 points listed in the codex. And for that you get 3 beasties at toughness 6, 5 wounds and a 5 plus save. They do only move 7 inches though so they might be a little bit slow to get to combat. As they charge in they do get a whole bunch of attacks. Pistols and hunting javelins for 2 attacks each at strength 4 as they charge in. Hunting blades with lance, strength 4, AP 1 and damage 1 for 3 attacks for the riders. And then the main event of the fight phase are their extra attacks from the rampager's fist. 4 attacks hitting on a 3. Strength 6, AP 1 and damage 2, all with sustained hits. Finally, as if that weren't enough damage profiles, they also get the line breaker special rule. When they end a charge move, each model in engagement range deals D3 mortal wounds on a 4+. plus. Potentially could be really quite a big help against bigger tougher targets if you can get multiple models in range. I did see someone mention in the comments for a previous video that that could actually trigger the crew damage buff. So even if you charge an intact enemy, you might do some mortal wounds and then get plus one to hit the squad from there. Overall, they do seem kind of fun to have a scary town melee unit. It does seem quite problematic if you had a bigger unit of six of them and stop the enemy shooting them with the stratagem in the crew detachment. But even just having one unit to counter charge and punish enemies trying to close with the town gun line seems fun. I'm a little bit unconvinced about them if they did wind up being 130 points. Seems a bit on the expensive side given how slow they move but points can always change at later dates.
Next up, we've got the Crutox Rider. Despite coming in the kits of one, I guess, alongside the hunting pack, these guys actually work out as cheaper than the Rampagers per model in-game. One to three models per unit, listed at 40 points each in the Codex, and they have a fairly similar profile to the Rampagers, moving seven and five wounds at toughness six with a five plus save. They gained a lot of bulky stats since their index version, plus one wound, plus one toughness, and plus one save from before. The Crutox Riders now get the choice of two different guns. The repeater cannon is the new version of what was called the Crute Gun before. Two shots out to 36 inch range, strength 7, AP 1, damage 2. This has gained rapid fire 2, so four shots within 18, and also a bit of AP. Otherwise, there's the option of the Tangle Cannon. D6 plus 1 shots at strength 6, AP 0, damage 1, and blast. In all honesty, I'd definitely take the repeater cannon over that though. Again, it's still a bit more of a general purpose unit. You get a little bit of melee from its rider, though the main event is similar sort of Crutox fist profiles to the Rampagers. They just don't get sustained hits or the impact hits. Otherwise, like the other Crute, he scouts 7 inches. And a special rule is a sort of return fire one. If Crute infantry gets shot within 6 inches of him, he can shoot back at the squad that fired him. Maybe plinky a wound or two if he is lucky. I was maybe a little bit disappointed that these guys couldn't do a bit more work against big enemy tanks and vehicles. Both them and the Rampagers probably aren't going to be able to handle heavy targets, so the crew detachments might need to fall back on a little bit of Tau Tech to handle enemy heavy armour. At 40 points, I'm not sure it's going to be standout. Doesn't seem awful for a slight bit of a placeholder type unit though. Doing a bit of screening and things in the backfield. Between the gun and the fist, his damage output really isn't too bad, but it's maybe just a bit slow and ungainly to bring it to bear. Lastly, for the mainline crew units, before we get into characters, there's the crew Hounds. These have got a new kit on the way, and there's going to be 5 or 10 models in the squad that were listed as 40 points per 5 in the Codex, though again that might change. Their stat line's broadly kind of similar. 12 inch moving dogs that are fairly easy to destroy, though do have stealth. They get 3 attacks, hitting on a 3 at strength 3 in close combat. They've had their special rules changed around a little bit. Their scout's move only goes to 7 inches rather than 9, so a little bit less midfield presence there. The other two things they have, I think, are quite interesting. Again, the option to get objective control from nearby characters. If there's something within 12 inches, they go to OC1, which is quite nice for a chaff unit like them. And if they start the turn within 6 inches of crude infantry, then they get to advance and charge, which is quite nice for fast-moving chaff. With a 7-inch pre-game move, they could absolutely be charging enemies in their own deployment zone turn 1. Probably not actually going to deal that much damage unless you have super light infantry to feast on but just having nuisance charges to tie up the enemy and stop them doing damage and think about falling back and things probably isn't what the enemy wants to deal with. Moving on, we've got four crew characters. First up, there's the Flesh Shaper. It's listed at 65 points in the Codex, and all the Shapers can lead the Carnivores or the Fast Orcas. They've got a pretty similar profile. Three wounds with the standard crew Toughness 3 and 6 plus save. For War Gear, he gets a Scatter Gun for kind of like two shotgun style shots, and Ritualistic Blades for a little bit of close combat threat, 4 attacks hitting on a 2 at strength 5, AP 1, damage 1 and twin linked. The special rules that he gives to his unit are Ritual Butchery, sustained hits 1 for melee weapons for his lead unit, a plus 25% damage buff there I suppose, though it is all going to be strength 4, AP 0 attacks, and Rites of Feasting for a 6 plus feel no pain for the unit, increasing to a 5 plus if his unit destroys something in the fight phase, and they have a bit of a feast. I feel like at 65 points though, I'm not sure he's really adding quite enough to the unit. A 6 plus feel no pain really isn't that big a durability buff, and gets extra meaningless if the opponent happens to be firing anything damage too against the crew, like heavy bolters, and the sustained hits in combat is alright. I'm just not sure if he's really adding more than you would get by getting another unit of crew carnivores on the table for more bodies and more damage though. Next up, there's the War Shaper, who's billed as the battle leader of the crew. He is listed as 60 points in the Codex, a similar sort of stat line, but slightly more threatening weapons. I feel like maybe the more interesting is the Dark Bow and Tri Blade. This one's D6 shots out to 24 inches, strength 4, AP 0 and damage 2, but it gets anti-infantry 3 plus and the assault and heavy keywords. That one pairs really quite nicely in the crew detachment with the 10 point enhancement for devastating wounds. It does turn him into an actual genuine damage dealing threat. The melee profile for that is 4 attacks at strength 5, AP 0, damage 1, though if you take the melee version of the model with the blade stave and prey hook, that instead gives you 4 attacks at strength 5, AP 1, damage 2, with lethal hits. 
In any case, this guy is basically functioning as the captain of the group pretty much. His special rule is war leader for a zero CP battle tactic once per battle round. Could be a command point reroll for a charge or something if you have nothing better to spend it on. And once per game, he can cancel battle shock with his root of honor special rule. Triggering at the start of the phase though, so it wouldn't necessarily stop you failing battle shock and then failing to score an objective. Overall, maybe a bit dependent on the battle tactic stratagems he can use. I guess he could use a trap well laid for his units to mark other units for extra AP. Maybe boost other crews by AP1 when shooting. My guess is that I don't think he could use the join the hunt one for the battle tactic stratagem when he dies. As by the time the units died, the crew shape is off the board and the ability wouldn't be being played anymore. Though I'm not 100% sure of that interaction. If that is the case and he could get to use that for free with a big squad of 20 crew carnivores, it could be very worth it for a squad that's guaranteed to recycle. Let me know if you have any thoughts on that interaction down in the comments. Lastly for the trio of shapers, we've got the trail shaper. This one's 55 points listed in the codex. Again, can lead the carnivores and fast stalkers. He gets just a bog standard crew rifle hitting on a 4 plus with 4 attacks at strength 5 in melee. For his boost, he gets trail finding, which is a once per turn reactive move of d6 inches when an enemy ends the movement within 9 inches. That could be disruptive on midfield objectives if the opponent's moving up to contest them. And his other one is crew ambush. He gets to redeploy this unit and one other crew unit after first turn has been determined. And he can also use it to put things in strategic reserves. That's really quite a nice one, perhaps particularly helpful with infiltrator units like the fast stalkers. Could be nice if he has joined a unit of them maybe. And could be pretty good with the Crutox Rampages as well. Allowing them to go the right way to try and get the closest to the prey as they possibly can. I feel like if he were going down a fairly heavy crew to army, he does feel like one of the more interesting ones. Certainly seems possible those boosts might do enough to be worth it, though he isn't going to be doing too much damage in his own right. Lastly, for the new and shiny crew goodness, we've got the Lone Spear. This one's a chameleonic outrider cavalry operating apart from its kindred. I feel like the rules for this guy are really quite interesting, though unfortunately he's listed as costing a whopping 110 points in the codex, which is more than I might have guessed. Lone operatives are definitely handy to have around, but generally maybe a bit more value in cheap ones, and the tower certainly have some other options. He does feel very big investment. For his stat line, he moves 12 inches, which is perhaps faster than I might have guessed. His toughness 5 with 6 wounds and OC2. He's a mounted character with lone operative, so you won't be able to shoot him outside of 12 inches, and he gets the stealth keyword. For his primary weapon, you get the choice of two different armaments, either a crew long gun, a strength 6 AP2 and damage 3 sniper weapon with heavy, or a rather fun and destructive looking blast javelin, 18 inches with D6 shots hitting on a 4, strength 10 AP2, damage 2 and blast. That thing packs a bit more of a punch than I was expecting to be honest. I feel like the tower could maybe learn a trick or two from that thing. In melee, that does improve his damage a little bit, getting 3 attacks at strength 4, AP-1 and lance, though it's still not huge there. Finally, the Calamandra gets to strike in melee as well. An extra 4 attacks at strength 5, AP-1 in close combat could be good for a couple of light infantry maybe. Otherwise, aside from a bit of incidental damage, he gets 2 main special rules. Perhaps the big one is that if you hit an enemy unit with a ranged attack, if other crew units attack that unit for the rest of the turn, they get to re-roll the hit roll. That can be range and melee, and I feel like that could be quite reliably put out with that crew long gun, hitting on 2 plus if he's static. Use that to mark a target, and then the rest of the kindred get significantly more dangerous. Could be pretty good for crew tox rampages charging in as well. His second special rule is fire and fade. He gets to move, shoot, move an additional 6 inches, though he can't charge if he does so. That does mean that he could be going kind of spectacularly fast across the board when you need him to. Move 12 and then use that to move a further 6. Definitely handy if he needs to get into a place to contest a primary or do a secondary. Though I feel like if he is indeed 110 points, you're going to need to get value out of him out of the buffing rule, plus his damage, plus his lone operative shenanigans. And it's maybe not absolutely easy to do all three of those perfectly. He definitely does have very interesting rules though. If he does have an appropriate points cost, I could see him being really an interesting unit, both for the crew and maybe even for the Tau. Leaving new crew things behind though, let's talk through the rest of the Tau data sheets, some of which are unchanged, plenty of which did get some interesting updates of one sort or another. Here are just a few of the highlights that we will talk through in time. Commander Farsight gets a 2 plus save and a 
and a 3 0 CP battle tactic stratagem once per battle round. Cold Star and Enforcer Commanders can't spam Cyclic Iron Blasters anymore, I'm afraid. They can do things like Quad Fusion Blaster. The Fire Warrior Strike Team swap their special rule to debuff enemy infantry for minus one to hit with a suppression fire round. That's far better than their old rule. And perhaps two of the units that were most improved out of the entire update are the Sky Ray and Stealth Suits. The Sky Ray gaining twin linked on its missiles, which is a massive boost, and Stealth Suits getting a guiding buff meaning that they can reroll ones to hit and wound for the target that they're guiding, far better than what they were before, and might compete against 412 Tetras finally. Otherwise, before we jump in, let's just talk through the war gear drones. As per 10th edition rules, they don't count as models, and you just get them as free war gear upgrades, it usually picks between some combination of these ones here. Most characters have the option to double up on two of the same one, though as mentioned, crisis suits can't now, and have to mix and match a bit. Out of these ones, shield drones grant plus one wound. They're really popular on any of the big suits. In general, I feel like crisis units are always going to want at least one of those in each selection. The marker drone grants the marker light keyword. Depends on whether the unit's going to be an observer unit or a mainline damage dealer there. The gun drone adds two shots, a ballistic skill 5 plus to 20 inches with the twin linked pulse carbine. Can mean that the squad gets the assault keywords to be able to advance and do actions if that's relevant. Plus just having a little bit of incidental volume fire isn't the worst thing in the world. And finally the missile drone can only be taken by the broadside and riptide. Again they have some helpful extra damage output. A missile pod shooting at ballistic skill 5 plus. There was a small change for this one. Previously they had AP minus 2 missiles for some reason. That's been rectified and consolidated in with the standard missile pod profile. They're now all AP1. I think for the broadsides I'd be debating between missile launchers or shield drones. Jumping into the actual data sheets though, let's start with infantry, then talk through other battle suits and vehicles, and finish up with characters. The strike team pre codex were 80 points, your standard issue fire warriors with the pulse rifles. Objective control 2, available in a 10 man squad, and able to put out a bit of damage against hordes, though aren't really going to worry other things. As mentioned briefly a second ago, they swapped out their special rule for one called suppression volley. You get to pick one infantry unit hit by this model's ranged attacks. That unit counts as suppressed and will be minus one to hit. Not going to be super relevant against literally every enemy army. But if they do have some sort of scary infantry unit, certainly doesn't hurt to ping that into them. At least it gives them something productive to do while they're sitting around on a home field objective. Maybe with an ethereal two Roslop command points. And it could still be an observer unit at the same time. They get two drones, one of which should definitely be a guardian drone. That means that when ranged attacks attack them, you minus one to wound for things targeting them, which is quite nice. Overall though, they're looking a little bit stronger than they were. I feel like that's a positive to swap out for the Overwatch style rule that they had before. They often weren't going to be the best target of that anyway. Next up, the Breacher team were maybe a bit more popular pre-codex. They cost a bit more at 90 points, but have more threatening guns. The Pulse Blaster getting two shots within 10 inches at strength 6, AP 1, damage 1, and getting to B roll the wound roll against enemies on objectives, which is quite good for clearing chaff fairly quickly and effectively. The Breacher Pulse Blasters retain their improved ballistic skill of 3 plus as well, far more accurate at base than most tower for some reason. I feel like these guys are still looking good, unless their points change radically. In the digital download, they're still looking very strong if they're jumping out of a devilfish, getting some wound rerolls. And they've got some okay stratagem support, both in Montcar and Kaoyon. They are quite nice with Kadra Flyer Blades as well. The Pathfinders are the town marker specialists that get some fun special weapons in their unit. Pre Codex, they were 90 points. Get to scout 7 inches forward, which could be interesting in devilfish as well. And they actually can pack a really vicious punch, able to take multiple special weapons. Either Rail Rifles for big hitting strength 10, damage 3 and devastating wounds, or Ion Rifles for mass strength 8, AP 2 and damage 2. Though both of these are heavy and they've got kind of bad ballistic skill if you're on the move. Still though, they are potentially really quite savage shooting. They also get a free EMP grenade launcher with either fusion or EMP shots. And get the choice of one of their specialist drones to support. Getting some funky special issue ones with the Grav Inhibitor drone of minus 2 to charge. The Pulse Accelerator drone increasing the range of their Pulse Carbines, or the Recon drone to allow them infiltrators and give them a burst cannon. They're well known for marking the enemy with their marker lights, and their spotting rule allows them to mark two different targets per turn. 
which is kind of weird, but given that they've got bigger and more threatening heavy weapons compared with the other tower infantry, they sort of feel like a unit that you wouldn't mind guiding. In any case, before the Codex, they certainly hadn't really been taken too often in competitive lists, I feel like they're far from unusable. Moving on to the other suits besides the Crisis, the broadside battle suits bring heavy firepower, pre-Codex they were 90 points each, and our walker vehicles, without the fly keyword, being able to be taken in squads of 1 to 3. Most people seem to prefer their heavy rail rifles to attacks at strength 12, AP 4 and damage D6 plus 1 with devastating wounds is pretty intimidating, generally taken a bit more compared with the high yield missile pods for a bunch of spam strength 7 damage 2. They're at least fairly tanky with toughness 8 and a 2 plus save, particularly if they get cover, they still get that weird 4 plus feel no pain type save against mortal wounds for some reason. That's not particularly relevant given that devastating wounds are no longer mortals. Otherwise it gets two hard points that you can still mix and match, taking either seeker missiles, weapon support systems for ignoring modifiers, and each suit can take one each of a twin plasma rifle or twin smart missile system. The unit has had a few changes, the plasma rifles are down to 18 inch range like the crisis suits, Smart Missile System really seems to have increased to a 4 shot gun from 3, though this does look like it's a typo to me given that all the rest of the Smart Missile Systems are only 3 shots, and they did lose the option to take the Battlesuit Support System, which allowed them to fall back and shoot, so if they get tagged in combat they're probably just to stand stationary and blaze away. I wouldn't say that's the biggest loss though, I'd much rather go for Ignore's Modifiers versus fall back and shoot in a unit that really shouldn't be getting charged anyway ideally. Overall, maybe not the most major changes ever, I still feel like those Seeker missiles will be threatening, Ignore's modifiers are still good. Probably the biggest shame for them are the plasma rifles, I did feel like it could be quite a nice secondary anti-tank shot at 24 inches, feels like it's just going to be a bit less likely to be in range of the same thing as the rail rifle at 18. Next up we've got the Riptide, which was kind of hilariously points cut and points cut for the whole of 10th edition. Pre-Codex it had been reduced all the way down to 165 points, and even then it hadn't become auto-include in competitive lists or anything like that. It's maybe a little bit disappointing that it didn't get any Codex changes, I guess in general they'll still be used for the Iron Accelerator maybe, 6 shots at strength 8, AP 3 and damage 4 with a good range with the Hazardous rule, plus backed up by a secondary weapon system, and overall just feel like they're a unit that's a fair bit more tanky compared with Dangerous, 14 wounds at toughness 9 and a 4 plus save does take a bit of focus fire to bring down. They do have some nice mobility advantages as well. They get to fall back and shoot, get devastating wounds once per game, and they get ignores modifiers built in as well, plus a couple of extra shots with missile drones. I feel like it will still be usable provided they don't bump the cost for some reason. Could be fun in Montcar with a lethal hit, which could make the iron accelerator a lot more general purpose or could be one of the best users of the failsafe detonator in the retaliation cadre. If you could align it so this guy blows up with d6 mortal wounds all over the heart of the enemy army, then you're probably in for a good time. I think it might have been nice though just to make its guns a bit more threatening, they just feel a bit underbaked for the massive size of the thing. One unit that did get a big improvement though were the stealth suits, they were 60 points per 3 pre-codex, a cheap infantry battlesuit unit with an 8 inch move and getting burst cannons plus a fusion blaster. They could set up in the midfield with infiltrators and also got stealth as you'd probably expect for a minus 1 to hit. Their big boost is their forward observer special rule. Now if they're the observer unit for a target you get to reroll hit rolls of 1 and wound rolls of 1 for their guided units. That usually equates to a 36% damage buff which could actually be the better way to go over Tetras now, depending on what other rerolls you've got going. Overall, unless they're spectacularly more costed after the points updates, they seem basically also include right now. Cheap infiltrator units are good to have in the first place. Being one of the best spotter units for dealing damage is an excellent advantage, and they even get a marker drone keyword plus the homing beacon to allow units to rapid ingress near them if it makes sense so a bit more utility there. Overall they do seem pretty good. Next up we've got the bigger badder stealth suit in the ghost kill. 160 points pre-codex and unchanged. I feel like this thing wasn't really something that needed changing particularly much to be honest. It was fairly effective already. A surprisingly big and dangerous lone operative unit that you can't shoot greater than 12 inches away. And even if you can it's kind of durable for the cost. 
a 2 plus save and 12 wounds with stealth and multiple abilities to make damage go to zero in a game. Really quite powerful to have some shooting that the enemy just can't shoot back whatsoever a lot of the time. And even if they can, then it's kind of tanky. Probably the cyclic iron breaker is the one that I like the most. Six shots at strength eight and damage three. You could take the fusion collider for a couple of really big scary melter shots. Plus has some secondary weapon systems as well. Overall seems like a nice enough unit to have in the codex in small numbers. Next up we've got the big bad walking battleship that is the Storm Surge. 400 points worth of super suit or covering guns, though technically not a battle suit by the keywords. The Tau Super Heavy is big and fairly tanky. Toughness 11, 20 wounds, a 2 plus save and a 4 plus invulnerable. It gets big hitting destroyer missiles and a cluster rocket system. And then the choice between a pulse blast or driver cannon. I'll probably go for the blast cannon myself. The crazy strength 24, AP 6 and damage 12 is almost worth it for the meme potential alone. Otherwise it's got some secondary weapon systems that you can have on top of that. A bunch of twin link stuff. The only small change that I noticed on the data sheet were smart missiles being increased from 2 shots to 3. Again a bit of a weird inconsistency compared with the rest before. Otherwise it can ignore modifiers to hit and is a specialist titan killer as well. He gets 2 reroll hit rolls against titanic or towering models. Overall it was maybe a little bit too costly to be considered one of the better mainline damage dealers before. I think it probably would need to go down a bit in cost to be tempting now. Next we've got the Tau Tanks and Vehicles. The Hammerhead Gunship is 130 points prior to the Codex. A 14 wound toughness 10 tank with a big gun. The Veil Gun is the classic all or nothing big shot. One shot at a crazy strength 20, AP 5 and damage D6 plus 6. Against Monsters and Vehicles you get to plus 1 to the hit roll. And the Targeting Array allows you to reroll one hit or wound roll. Meaning that you've got a better chance than normal of that shot connecting. I'd probably rate that slightly over the Ion Cannon which gets you d6 plus 6, fairly general purpose, strength 8 and damage 3 shots, not too bad against medium infantry I guess. Otherwise I quite like the accelerator burst cannons for the secondary weapons, a bunch of strength 6 AP minus 1 is quite nice to have. The only datasheet change in the codex is that the smart missile systems got replaced by two individual ones, previously it was one twin links profile, technically that's a small firepower upgrade if you were taking them for a tiny bit of chip indirect fire. Overall was pretty usable before, still seems pretty scary. The Hammerhead might have some really quite serious competition for the top dog in the Tau armour though. The Sky Ray gunship was 130 points as well pre-codex and basically comes with the same sort of profile. Swapping out the hit buff for aerial scanners to allow you to re-roll hit rolls against fly units and its primary weapon is the Seeker Missile Rack. This one gets you 3 shots at strength 14, AP minus 3 and damage D6 plus 1, so quite a fearsome anti-tank profile to start with. But this now got the twin links rule as well, so you're getting to re-roll those wound rolls that you fail, which would usually be on a 3 plus anyway. Really quite a big damage boost there. I think for the raw numbers for a dedicated armour busting roll, that would put the Sky Ray slightly ahead. I feel like these ones could be a particularly interesting unit going forward. They maybe don't use crazy amounts of the detachment synergies and things, but just having a big threatening tank with some fairly devastating anti-tank firepower is hard to go too far wrong with. For the scout support vehicle of the Tau, there's the Piranha. 55 points for a fast 14 inch moving little skimmer with toughness 7, 7 wounds and a 4 plus save. This also gets to scout 9 inches into the mid board, so it could be potentially doing things like annoying move blocks turn 1 if you want it. Overall fairly handy to have just as a cheap little disruption unit. It gets a few gun drone shots plus either a piranha burst cannon which is like the accelerator profile or a fusion blaster that gets upgraded to melter 4 but is otherwise the same. Perhaps the real threat of it is that it gets two seeker missiles so quite a big alpha strike on turn 1 if you want it. Otherwise the special rule is drone harassment tactics handing out battle shock at 12 inches. Maybe not the most relevant in your turn though, unless your opponent has got things that really cared about using one certain stratagem. Overall for 55 points I think that these are fairly good value. Probably a bit more useful in annoying speed and move blocking type things as opposed to actual damage. But they're certainly not awful for that with the Seeker missiles. Next up and previously 75 points we've got the Devilfish. A cheap and effective transport with very good durability at toughness 9 and a big 13 wounds. It moves fast as well at 12 inches. 
And again, like the Piranha for a cheap transport isn't completely useless in terms of threat. Getting two seeker missiles and some volume fire. Again, they're getting the same smart missile system change as the tanks. Overall, pretty excellent value to roll up the board and deliver a breacher squad into pulse blaster range. It can advance and drop them if it wants to, but will be missing out on its firepower most of the time. Overall, I think it's really good value if it does remain this sort of points cost. Cheap, tough and surprisingly threatening for transport and gets breaches where they need to be. Next, we've got the Tau Flyers. The Razor Shark Strike Fighter was 165 points, a 12 wound toughness 10 aircraft, no hover so it has to start off the board. Then it swoops on turn 2 most likely, firing off seeker missiles and that quad ion turret for 8 shots at AP2 damage 2 with twin links. As it goes its firepower really isn't awful, it does get a plus 1 to hit against anything that doesn't have fly, but it maybe just feels a bit inflexible compared with some of the other options for damage dealing. The Sunshark Bomber does have a very similar sort of profile, kind of similar weapons and supporting things, swapping out that quad ion turret for two twin ion rifles that get slightly fewer shots. This guy loses the plus one to hit against ground units for a bomb attack, though it does mean that you'll usually only be able to bomb turn three earliest if you turn up turn two and then move to fly over something. Like at least one other bomber that we've seen so far, the bombs have been reduced from D6 rolls of a 3+, plus to trigger those mortal wounds down to a 4+, plus. not that they were particularly strong to start with. Maybe still not absolutely awful for a fast-moving gun turret, but I feel like you're probably going to be better off with things like sky rays or hammerheads or battlesuit type things. Next up, we've got the Vespid Stingwings, 5 models for 65 points prior to the update, and locks to just a squad size of 5. These guys are sort of interesting utility infantry, moving 12 inches with fly and having toughness 4 and a 4 plus save. They can deep strike in as at least a somewhat cheap unit to do secondaries and have an option to jump on and off the board with airborne agility which could mean that they get redeploys over the game. It is at a bit of an awkward timing though at the end of the movement phase as opposed to triggering at the end of the enemy turn which is a bit more normal for similar units there. They do have perhaps some surprisingly dangerous small arms as well. Two shots each with their neutron blasters at strength 5, AP 2 and damage 2. Unfortunately you can't guide them though as they don't have the greater good. Maybe not too bad for a fairly cheap and perhaps surprisingly threatening little chaff unit. Next up we have the Tidewall fortifications. The slow moving fortifications that you can crew with fire warriors to allow them to fire out of them with a little bit of defence. And there's basically three different flavours of fortification structure that you can get. The shield line, gun rig and drone port. This one's the shield line and is essentially a fortification transport vehicle pretty much. 10 wounds at toughness 8 with a 5 plus invulnerable save makes it the toughest out of them. You can pay an extra 20 points to give it a defence platform which gives it another 5 wounds and extra transport capacity. I guess the idea is that you have your fire warrior squad sat on this and blaze away with the firing deck special rule. I guess it could also give cover to things behind it as well. But overall just between objective control zero and moving very slowly and being more expensive than a devilfish, between all that it rarely gets looked at compared with the more iconic tower transport. Otherwise there's a couple of minor variations of it. The drone port gives you a similar idea to station a fire warrior squad and then it has an interesting special rule where its drone defenders shoot every single unit within 20 inch range of it if it can see. Sounds kind of good, but at the same time it's only 8 shots that hit on a 5+. plus. I guess it could be alright if your opponent's got loads of multiple small units and things that actually care about being shot by strength 5 AP0. Finally there's the Tidewall Gun Rig, 90 points and again unchanged in the codex. This one's a bit tougher with 14 wounds and it gets the interesting Supremacy Railgun. Basically the same issue one as the one that you'd find on the hammerhead tank but with twin linked for re-roll the wound roll. But unfortunately it only hits on a 5+, plus, meaning it will spend the vast majority of the game doing absolutely nothing unless you get very lucky and you can't guide it. Realistically again you're probably better off with the devilfish and the more guaranteed seeker missiles and things compared with this thing even if the big hit and miss gun does seem kind of fun. Finally moving on to characters and first up we have the commander in the enforcer battlesuit. If you want a crisis commander to lead your squad it's either him or the cold star now. The generic crisis one has gone the way of the dodo. He was the one who gave you reroll hit rolls of one. This guy is the tough one. 
He moves slowly at 8 inches but gets a 2 plus armor save plus reduces enemy AP by 1. That buff might be a bit more relevant on the fire knife or the star side ones potentially given that they don't get a shield generator. Otherwise, he's fairly similar to the unit that he was before. He can still get a quadruple set of most of the weapons. He just can't do it with cyclic ion blasters or air bursting fragmentation projectors. Those ones, he can only take one of each. Overall, still seems pretty interesting to me. Maybe in a Sunforge unit, allowing him some reroll wounds against monsters and vehicles. He could take four accurate fusion blasters to add to their damage output and also get those rerolls to wound. Or mix it up with some more mixed weaponry or get things like a shield generator or some of the support systems. Otherwise the other option is the cold star battle suit. He doesn't get the 2 plus save but he does move 12. And his special rule is to buff the unit that he's leading giving it a movement characteristic of 12 and the assault keyword for its weapons. The cold star was certainly really popular when you could have cyclic ion blaster units in big squads of 6 hurtling all over the board and getting lines of sight on things. I guess could still be pretty relevant given the detachments that give you advantages for getting close to the enemy like the retaliation cadre, plus helping out with getting things like fusion blasters and plasma rifles onto their targets in general. Like the enforcer, he can't duplicate cyclic ion blasters anymore, just one per model, and the plasma rifles are 8 in inch range like the rest. He also gets the option to take the high output burst cannon too, which could make him kind of fun with the star scythe ones I guess, that would get them a bit of AP on that. For the named commanders, we've got Commander Shadow Sun at 100 points. She fights as a lone operative in her custom stealth battle suit, and if you take her, she's got to be nominated as the Warlord. I feel like her datasheet worked at least fairly well already, and it does seem that she hasn't got any changes in the codex. A lone operative with 6 wounds and toughness 4, with the minus 1 to wound from the Guardian drone. Two really quite big hitting shots from the high energy fusion blasters at 18 inches and strength 10 plus a bunch of light missiles and flechette blasters to follow that up, and then a couple of sort of mid-tier buffs for units nearby her. You get a 6-inch aura of re-roll hit rolls of 1, and a 6-inch aura of farming command points on a 5+, plus if you use any stratagems for units nearby there. Overall, I think between the damage threat, lone operative, and multiple useful aura buffs, I feel like it's fairly hard to go too far wrong with in most attachments, Plus could be interesting with Kaoyon with that wall of mirror stratagem to have her jumping around the board. Quite nice when you can do that with a lone operative with some ranged damage. Commander Farsad on the other hand did get a few changes. He has his armour improved with the 2 plus save rather than the 3 plus armour that he had before. That's handy enough though he also got a rather interesting change in he swapped his big turn of melee rerolls for free stratagems. He's now basically acting as a standard captain for crisis suits, getting a free 0 CP battle tactic stratagem each battle round, maybe a little bit detachment dependent there. He can lead any of the variant crisis battle suit units, and now the rule that states that he can't be fielded alongside ethereals within the same army as on his datasheet, rather than slightly awkwardly being a detachment rule. Otherwise he's still fairly threatening, two shots with that high intensity plasma rifle that still managed to keep its 24 inch range, the Dawnblade gets a bunch of strength 10 and damage 3 attacks in melee, and he can threaten tank shot quite well. And finally, he does give his unit a really quite nasty damage buff. If you can get them within 9 inches, then you can get plus 1 to the wound roll on your target. That does seem like it would work very nicely with that retaliation cadre, actually having a reliable way to actually having a reliable way to get that active with that 3 inch drop option. Feels like you could put a very dangerous unit exactly where you need it. Moving on to the non-battle suit characters, and first up we have the Ethereal. 50 points for a 3 wound character with a 5 plus invulnerable save, moving 10 inches most of the time with its hover drone, presuming you take one. The Ethereal gives their squad a 5 plus feel no pain, a 6 plus leadership, and has a slightly unreliable command point farming mechanic. Rolling a d6 on a 4 plus 2 generator command point, you roll for it at the end of the command phase apparently now. Overall, I feel like between the feel no pain and the command point generation, it's really not the worst model to have in the world. Probably stuck in a strike squad that's manning a home field objective. They could contribute a little bit of firepower to enemy light infantry downrange and potentially hand out that minus one to hit debuff as well now. Plus could be reasonable enough to bear certain enhancements like the spotting for sustained or lethal hits. Overall, fairly usable. I think it might have been nice if that command point farming was a little bit more reliable though. Next up we've got the Kadra Fireblade, 
40 points pre-codex and a unit that was genuinely taken quite a bit alongside breaches. Perhaps might be good news that his unchanged index to codex then. He still has his main buff of adding one to the attack characteristic of ranged weapons for his units. So that's to be three shot breaches. A chip in with three shots from his own strength 5 damage 2 pulse rifle as well. Overall seems nice enough. He can take a couple of drones of your choice as well. Plus has the option just to hit extra hard with his own pulse rifle from time to time. Getting AP-3 on a critical wound from that. Seems like you could do worse with one jumping out of a devilfish. The Firesight team was 70 points pre-codex, alone operatives and infiltrators and stealth units. They're treated like a single model in the rules with 4 wounds, getting some sniper shots at strength 5, AP 1, damage 2 and precision. Overall maybe not the worst for a medium cheap lone operative to camp in the backfield and take up space. The sniper damage I do think is a bit anemic as well and their precise targeting special rule maybe isn't the best. It means that you get 2 reroll all hits if you're guided by another unit, but I feel like given how cheap and low threat they are, they're unlikely to be worth guiding unless you're out of other options. I guess they could be somewhat interesting as a character to potentially bear certain enhancements. Finally, last but by no means least, we have Dark Strider. He was 60 points pre-codex and is entirely unchanged. He's the character that can lead the Pathfinder team. Gets a fancy pulse carbine called Shade with strength 5, AP 0 and damage 2. And he helps out with two special rules, plus Wonder Wound for the Pathfinder shooting, which is kind of meaningful when you're using it on rail rifles and ion rifles. And he also gets himself a jammer array as well. Enemy units can't be set up within 12 inches of the model from reserve. That could be handy enough to have towards the front of the unit in the midfield, perhaps. I feel like it's probably a fun choice more so than a competitive one, really. At 60 points plus 90 points worth of Pathfinders, you've made a very, very fragile unit for 150 points there. Certainly one that has some fun and fairly scary shooting, though. Far more than most Tau infantry. So with that, that just about brings us to the end of the data sheets in Codex Tau Empire. Overall, I feel like this Codex has perhaps been a bit of a mixed bag. Some things that people don't really look particularly happy about, but other things that are perhaps better than some of the other Codexes that have come out in the edition so far. Probably the change that's going to cause the most consternation are the Crisis Suits. I feel like splitting them off into different units maybe wasn't the worst thing ever. It did come at perhaps a surprising amount of cost of customizability though. I feel like most people were expecting Cyclic Ion Blasters not to be the spammed thing anymore, but locking out choices of Fusion Blasters versus Weapon Systems, more restrictive drones and squad sizes is dropping to 3, is going to turn off at least a few people, even if the end units do wind up being interesting. I still think that Sun Forge seems like it could be one of the most fun ones on paper, getting big wound and damage rerolls for a unit like that is pretty scary with Melter. Otherwise, for data sheet changes, the biggest out and out winners feel like the stealth suits and the sky rays. Sky rays just look like they're dangerous anti tank with big missiles, which is nice. The stealth suits seem like they're fairly godly buffing units now. We wouldn't be too surprised if we see plenty of them in the future. The new crew data sheets, I think, seem interesting per the rules, but they'd have to be really quite cheap if they were going to be massively competitive. Perhaps particularly the characters look a little bit overcosted by those initial points reveals. It would have been nice if the crews had had a bit more scope to carry themselves against the toughest things around. It still does look like they'll need Tau help with high saves and heavy armoured units. Rampage of Fists and Crude Guns just aren't really going to quite cut it against those kind of targets. It is a bit of a shame to lose a bunch of data sheets as well. I'm sure that Long Strike will be sorely missed alongside some of the others. Finally, for the detachments, I think that Games Workshop have actually done quite well with the ones that they've given them. It was kind of surprising that there were only four, though all the ones here have at least something interesting to play around. Maybe the Montcar one feels like the most exciting and dangerous out of the new ones for a more balanced Tau army. If you did want to skew all battle suits or heavy crew, though, then both of those detachments do look fun. It'll be interesting to see what people wind up playing with once they've actually got models on the table. And finally, as always with my videos, please feel free to let me know if I've made any mistakes or omissions down in the comments below. I'm sure there'll be some stuff that slips through given that it's really quite a big codex with quite a few subtle updates. I'll aim to post any corrections down in a pinned comment. There were a few data sheets that I couldn't confirm for this one and only had to rely on text leaks of the fact that then nothing had changed for them. If anything else did change or I've got any other major updates, I'll pin it down in a pinned comment below.
In any case, if you've enjoyed the video, then feel free to subscribe to Allspets Tactics. I'll certainly aim to keep a few more TAR videos coming over the next week or so. Could be fun to do a few unit reviews with the new book. Otherwise, finally, I'd just like to mention that if you have been enjoying the videos on the channel, particularly big, long, high effort projects like this, I would just like to mention that the channel does have a Patreon page as well, and you can find that linked in the video description if you'd like to help support and keep these videos coming. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things come next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with a chance to win some big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.